Good morning, church. Welcome to the San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church. We are streaming live on Facebook and recording on YouTube. Uh, however you have found us, uh, we are glad that you are here, that you are being a part of this worship time together. Maybe a, send, uh, maybe a friend sent you a link uh, this morning. Uh, maybe someone just put something in your inbox and you said, you know, I'll check this out. However you are here, we're glad that you're joining us. Uh, we want you to just uh, take a moment, if you are with us live, uh, go ahead and pass the peace with one another. Maybe just put a little comment in, peace be with you, or it's so good to see you this morning. Just take a moment now and go ahead and do that. This has been such a strange year for Christmas, hasn't it? Uh, I almost thought of buying one of those upside-down Christmas trees this year just because it felt so much more appropriate to have something turned upside down because it feels like our experience this year is so different. The traditions are not the same. But maybe that's a good thing for us as we think about the original Christmas. For Mary and Joseph... Their world was turned upside down as she was pregnant and as the census happened and everybody, it seemed, in their world was suddenly having to be on the move uh, as they were counted. And for them, it would have felt very much like it feels for us now, that things were disjointed and out of place. And so let's, rather than fighting that strangeness, that upside-downness, let's consider embracing an upside-down Christmas this year, and let it inform us on how we might be changed in new ways as we experiment, experience Advent in this way. We're going to continue our worship this morning by sharing our tradition of the Advent wreath, but this year the Advent wreath continues to travel from home to home in this upside-down way of celebrating. The Dastic family will share with us at this time. Today we light the fourth candle on the Advent wreath, the candle for love. Hear now from the Book of Psalms. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord. Forever with my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. New life is coming. We can count it in days now. God is breaking through. God's word will change the world. We will all be changed by the language of love. The covenant has come down through the generations. The love of God is never ending. We give thanks for God's faithfulness. Today we relight the candles of hope, peace, and joy. And we light the candle of love. We give thanks for God's steadfast love. i 
Hear now today's scripture reading from the book of Luke. And Mary said, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercies flow in wave after wave, on those who are in awe before him. He bared his arm and showed his strength, scattered the bluffing braggarts. He knocked tyrants off their high horses, pulled victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered and piled on the mercies, piled them high. It's exactly what he promised, beginning with Abraham and right up to now. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Teresa. Uh, that was from the message, and so it might have sounded a little bit different. The language might have been a little bit fresher. Uh, surprised us even. We're going to jump into this message in just a moment on this strange and upside down way of understanding Christmas. Uh, but would you first just pray with me? Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, you who are our strength, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. There is a very popular book that's often given to new parents called What to Expect When You Are Expecting. What to Expect While You Are Expecting, I think, would also be a great title for Advent, right? This is a time of great expectations. And certainly Mary could teach us a thing or two about what to expect when we are expecting. Are we expecting Jesus to come and change our reality? How will Jesus change how we see ourselves and how we see the world? And today we're going to be looking at Mary's song as we're reflecting. But for now, for a moment, I want you just to imagine yourself in the future. Maybe it's next year. God willing, with the vaccine and all these other uh, measures that are being put in place, next year Christmas will be different. And perhaps you can imagine yourself at a Christmas party uh, with friends, uh, reacquainting yourself after all this time. And at this party, 
there might be some new people, people that you haven't met before, or perhaps you had met them but you didn't recognize them because they were wearing their masks. And you might wonder, are they important people? Are they influential? Um, will they honor us by being here? Uh, you might ask, how will people see me when we reconnect again? And so today, I'd like to just ponder that as we think about status. Status, the way that we see ourselves and the other people in kind of the social order. And in order to do that this morning, we're going to do a little bit of a social experiment and indeed, that experiment has already started in a way because uh, I sent out a Facebook request this week and some of you answered that. So thank you for that. And I asked you to rate um, six professions and put them in order from highest status down to lowest status. And so the order that you all gave us... Uh, on that survey was the highest status was a medical doctor. Medical doctor was the highest status. The next status that you all gave was a professional football player. The next one was a minister. After that, truck driver. Going down the social ladder. Custodian, and at the bottom of the ladder, at this party, was the pregnant teenager. And I really appreciate those of you who went ahead and jumped into that experiment. Some of you anticipated what I was going to be talking about today and began to switch the order around. And that's okay too. This is a smart congregation, and I know that you're already thinking, you're always two steps ahead, and I love that about this place. Donald Craybill uh, is a pastor and sociologist who wrote a book called The Upside Down Kingdom. The Upside Down Kingdom. And in that, he talks about the way that Jesus coming into the world changed the social order. It changed people's uh, statuses completely, flipped them upside down. And if we spend time with Jesus in the scriptures, as Donald Craybill did, uh, in his book, well, it, it doesn't take very long to see that Jesus immediately starts this upside-down work. Uh, John chapter 4, uh, Jesus meets up with a Samaritan woman that everyone else had discounted. And you're right, she's got three strikes against her as he meets her. First, she's a woman. Um, second, she's a Samaritan woman. And thirdly, she is a woman who has been caught in sin. Um, she uh, sells her body. And so those three things would have normally pushed her aside. Instead, Jesus chooses her to be the one to whom he reveals himself as the Messiah. Think of this. So many other people um, he could have revealed to, but he chooses her to let her know what his mission actually is. And the Gospel of Luke says that Mary sang a song, right? She just sang a song. It just poured out of her as she was listening. And she learned that God would use her. She could not hold it in. She said, He has thrown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You know, see, Mary seems to get Jesus right from the beginning. Before anybody else, mother knows best. She gets that he is here to turn the world upside down because if God could use her, if God could use even her, then God could use anybody. God has plans of shifting the entire social order. So let's look at this social ladder, if we can, if we can come back to this. Let's look at this social ladder upside down for a moment. In God's kingdom, 
And I'm just going to take the pictures and turn them exactly upside down from what you all had said would be what normally would happen in society. And some of you may have already been on this page. Turning these pictures upside down. Hopefully you can see that from where you are. What does Christmas teach us about how we see ourselves and others? You know, I believe that Christmas turns our expectations upside down. God does not care how much money you have or the authority that you have within your profession or how much influence you have or perhaps even how holy you are right now. Some of us, I know myself as a minister, we need to be reminded sometimes that God works upside down and backward. God does not work the way the rest of society works. And it's a, it's a difficult lesson to learn. Now, I shared this story a little bit in a newsletter article, but I wanted to share it again here because I think it, it really shares the heart of this. Um, some of you may know that my family, my, my mother's hometown, is in Almora, India. And Almora is set in the foothills of the Himalayas. And in the foothills of the Himalayas, you are very much cut off from the rest of the world. Um, it's a place that's very remote, very difficult to get to. You don't go there unless you know someone or you have a very um, profound reason to make the dangerous trek. Some people made their way to Almora uh, because they had leprosy. Uh, people who had Hansen's disease, as we say it now. And those people would trek through the mountains to try to make their way to what was a Methodist mission for people with Hansen's disease. As it turns out, my family, uh, my mom's family, my, her dad, was a doctor for people with leprosy. He was also a Methodist minister. And so my family's origin is from that compound in the leprosy hospital. And so they were used to seeing these people who would come, who had been shunned in every other part of their world, but they were welcomed into the compound. Um, by the time I had come and stayed in that compound years later, most of the leprosy patients um, now we're being cured and we're even being returned home and, and living their lives. Uh, but some remained uh, on campus. They were not uh, able to kind of reintegrate. And I remember my uncle who had taken over the medical practice uh, for all kinds of people who wandered into the mountains looking for help. My uncle took me down into the compound and he shared with me something that I'll never forget. He shared with me, he said, look, look into this room. Do you see this man? And I looked into the room as an early uh, teenager. And as I looked in, I saw a man who did not, not have a, a nose, did not have lips. And my mind, you know, I just wanted to turn away. And he said, look at him. He said, do you know who he is? What do you think of him? And of course, in my mind, I thought, I don't know why my uncle is showing me this person. Why is he showing this, this dingy man in this room? And he said, this man knows more than four languages. This man is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. And from that day, after meeting that man, I began to realize that we can never judge a person by what we think their status is. We can never judge a person by how important or influential we think they are. I learned from my uncle that we must always judge people. We must always judge people from the heart. My grandfather used to um, treat leprosy patients, and the first thing that he would do is he would take off his gloves. Because at that time, there was great fear 
for leprosy patients. But these people had not been touched for many years, very much like we have fear now. He took off the gloves, and he would touch them. And sometimes that would be the most healing part for them because they were re-included into the human race. They were touched by a human being after many years. And those lessons have taught me that we cannot see people of a different race or with a different accent or with a disability um, without recognizing that all that status stuff does not matter in the kingdom of God. We need to see the deep potential in each person, just as Jesus once came to the Samaritan woman, or just as Jesus was born from the most common person imaginable. And we begin to see what we could not see, that each person is Christmas. Christ coming, turning our expectations upside down. How do we see the world from Jesus' point of view? How do we turn our lives upside down and love and hope again? And I hope you take from this message two pieces, two lessons for Mary. The first is this. Treat people with respect before you know what their profession is or what their status is. Ask yourself, if this person was a CEO or a doctor, how would I listen and be ready? How would I be ready to learn from them? And then treat people in that way. And I think right now, with all this time that we are wearing our masks, have you noticed that it's, it's hard to recognize people when they have their masks on? And I wonder if this is not a bad thing for us in some ways. Because every single person we see who we think is a stranger might actually be a friend. What if we could treat each person as if they had status, as if they were a deep friend? How would that change the world? The second thing, maybe like Mary, we can see that Christ is living in us. Now, we often say this as the Holy Spirit, right? But it doesn't need to be uh, that theologically difficult to wrap our minds around. Um, it's just the realization that love, love inside has to find a way out. Sue Monk Kidd, a uh, spiritual writer, uh, a prolific writer, uh, once wrote about her experience as she was visiting a monastery. Uh, it was around Christmas time, and Sue was passing by a monk, and just, imp just impromptu, she said, Merry Christmas! <laughs> and the monk turned slowly, nodded his head, and said, May Christ be born in you. And she thought of this many years later, as she was wondering this, and she recognized what he was trying to say was Christmas is about transformation. It's as she said, discovering our soul and letting Christ be born from the waiting heart. To put it crudely, we're all pregnant during Advent, we're all excited. I wish I could be as excited about Christmas as my kids are right now, but we're all excited. We're all excited for what may come. And like John the Baptist, uh, we are not the Christ, but we testify to the reality that Christ is coming, that the world is being turned upside down, and that's a good thing. So what do we expect while we're expecting we expect that if we are feeling right now like we are on the bottom rung of life, it will not last long. Take heart. If you feel low down, things are going to change. 
We expect that the, fo- the poor will finally be filled. We expect that we'll be able to see ourselves as children of God. We expect that each person, each person is of sacred worth and full of Christ. We expect Jesus Christ to change the social structure to turn everything upside down. We expect that the rungs will be, rem- will be moved. That's what we mean when we say God is reconciling the world. God is turning the world upside down. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's continue to celebrate that strange way as we listen. must have been surprised at where this road had taken him cause never in a million lives would he have dreamed of Bethlehem and standing at He saw with his own eyes The message from the angel come to life And Joseph said, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade Why him of all the rulers in the Inside this stable filled with hay Why her? She's just an ordinary girl Now I'm not one to second guess What angels have to say But this is such a strange way Save the world To think of how it could have been Jesus had come as he deserved There would have been no better Joseph knew the reason love had to reach so far. And as he held the Savior in his arms, he must have thought, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him with all the rulers in the world why inside this table filled with hay why her she's just an ordinary girl now I'm not one to second Such a strange way
All of worship has prepared us for this moment of prayer. Prayer might seem a strange way to save the world, but it is the most powerful response we have to the joys and concerns that we carry on our hearts. So I invite you into this moment by taking an inhale and an exhale, perhaps even closing your eyes and let the silence hold you. There are some angel messages that can only be heard in the silence. There are some insights that can only get into our hearts when we prepare the way by offering ourselves in silence to this time of prayer. We turn to God, even if we're not sure what that means, we just turn with the expectation that there is a divine, loving presence holding us in this moment. So join me. Join me as we pray together. In this moment, we say happy birthday to Flo Spanier, who is celebrating her 99th birthday on December 22nd. We give thanks for you, Flo, and we pray for a continued years of health and well-being. We give thanks for this generous community of faith and how you all responded to our Angel Tree event. Each year in the season, we partner with other local nonprofits, which walk, aside, walk alongside the most vulnerable. And this year, your generous giving made possible gifts to 131 people. Thank you. Thank you for making this a season where all received a loving, kind word and gift. In moments of prayer, we trust God to be with those in pain or suffering. We pray for Catherine Godby, who had a pin put in her hip following a fall earlier this week. She's doing well, and we pray for her continued strength and healing. We pray for Kat Patsy Kyles following the death of her brother Oscar this week. Oh God, comfort and guide this family when they gather for a private service after Christmas. Hold them, hold them all in your tender, loving care. We pray for Susan Dowling's dad, Don, who is on hospice care and taking one day at a time. We trust you are holding all caring for him and Don as well. We pray for Judy Bauerlein's brother-in-law, who is also Mary Cat DeWalt's uncle. Don was in the hospital for treatment and contracted COVID and was on oxygen earlier this week. We know your presence, O oh God, is holding him and all in your tender, loving care. We pray for health and wisdom during this time when there's a surge in the coronavirus. Keep us safe. Protect all those who are working in hospitals and care centers. Provide us all with the grace, strength, and wisdom we need, one moment at a time. And we continue to pray together. Remind us again, O oh God, of how you came to us in the most unexpected of ways in the flesh, revealing the divine in us, in all of us. You came to set us free from fear so that our ordinary lives reveal the greatest gift of all. You, with us, wherever we find ourselves, whatever joy or sorrow we carry, you, O oh God, are with us, inviting us to let our, our lives be prayers that turn to you and trust you again and again and again. And so we continue 
by praying together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are a generous congregation, a generous community. Thank you. Thank you for your faithful financial donations during this time. And all the information about how to give is on the slide in front of you or can be found on the website when you click on the Give link. In addition to the logistics involved, there is also the spiritual journey involved in giving, the way to find hope, peace, Joy and love is in the, in the experience and participation of giving. So thank you for all those who have handed in pledges for our, next, our coming year, 2021. And if that pledge is still on your desk or under a pile on your dining room table, please, please send it in. And thank you. Thank you to all those who have increased their pledge, knowing that there will be others among us where that is not possible this year. And if you have never pledged to this church, I invite you to begin that process. Again, find it on the website about how to do that, of $25 a month for 2021. And then we will know that there is a divine presence alive in our world because your donations help us be that type of community in the world. Thank you for being a generous community. Thank you. 
O oh God of healing and peace, we come before you today with a stew pot full of emotions. We're joyful in celebrating your arrival among us, fearful of the circumstances this year has brought, saddened by the losses of family, friends, jobs, and opportunities. Yet we're hopeful that with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can help to bring your kingdom to earth. In this busy time of year, please guide us so that we use our gifts to serve you and work together to share your peace. Amen. And here are a few ways to participate in celebrating God's presence here among us. One of the ways we serve the broader community is by having our playground open in a COVID-safe way. And we need volunteers, hosts, and hostesses that will open the playground, welcome families, and then wipe down. We have all those materials there. Wipe down high-use areas for the next family that will come in in half an hour. We've shortened the time, knowing that it's safe between when families could come. And if you would sign up and volunteer for this, you can contact Laura Roy. Her email is on the slide as well as on the website. And I can tell you, there is no greater joy than hearing children laughing on the playground. So I hope you'll consider serving in that way. And as we move into the longest night of the year, which is tomorrow, we have two uh, events to welcome you to. One it will be outside the sanctuary from 3 to 5 p.m. tomorrow. It's called Linger at the Manger. And when you arrive with your masks on, you'll find that there is a prayer stone in front of the sanctuary. And you can hold that and be aware of whatever discomfort, burden, or um, awareness you are carrying. And then place that in the manger. Release that. Surrender that. There will be Stephen ministers present, and they um, will just greet you, or if you want a private conversation with masks on, they'll be available to, to listen and to pray with you as well. Later that evening, from 7 to 7.30 on Zoom, we will gather for the service of, a long, of the longest night, a service that recognizes sometimes all the cheer and brightness of the season does not match our experience that we're missing a loved one, that we're filled with fear or anxiety. And so we gather for a reflective service. The Zoom link is on our website, and all are invited to this time where we, we acknowledge where we are in this season, and we invite God to walk alongside us, because that is, that is the way God takes care of us. And finally, on Christmas Eve, we will be offering two services, both um, a family service with the children's pageant and later a candlelight service. Again, these will be posted all of Christmas Day on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, so you can watch with your family and loved ones at the time that's convenient for you. May our season, our Christmas, be both safe and sacred as we journey towards Bethlehem together.
So go now and take heart. This may seem like a strange and upside down Christmas season. It's okay. Perhaps the season of Christmas was never meant to be right side up. So go, go and see the potential in every human being you encounter and even yourself. May Christ be born in you. Amen.